The Adventures of Superman radio show, which ran in various forms from 1940 to 1951, didn't make use of villains from the comics. Listeners never heard about Lex Luthor, or the Ultra Humanite, or the Toy Man, or Mr. Mixius Pitlick, or any of the other bad guys who threatened Superman in the pages of DC Comics in the 1940s. The Superman of the radio show mostly found himself opposing one-off villains, gangsters, crooked public officials, mad scientists, the occasional alien. But the writers of the radio show did create their own rogues gallery of recurring villains to challenge their version of the Man of Steel. There's the Scarlet Widow, there's Nazi mad scientist Der Teufel, and there's Der Teufel's creation, kryptonite-powered supervillain the Atom Man, who becomes one of the few adversaries to present a serious physical challenge to Superman and nearly kills him at one point. For my money, however, the best recurring villain on the Adventures of Superman radio show, and the one that spoke most strongly to what made that show special, was a character who wasn't a physical match for Superman at all, who wasn't a mad scientist, who wasn't an alien. He was an ordinary human, a metropolis political boss, and a racist named George Latimer. In an earlier video about the radio show, I focused on a story called The Clan of the Fiery Cross, which saw Superman and his friends at the Daily Planet face off against a hate group that was a very thinly veiled stand-in for the Ku Klux Klan. I also mentioned another story, The Hate Mongers Organization, which concluded just a month before the airing of the first episode of The Clan of the Fiery Cross, which also saw Superman and his friends at the Daily Planet face off against a hate group. The creators of The Adventures of Superman regularly used their highly rated show to speak out against white supremacy, xenophobia, religious bigotry, and other forms of intolerance. It wasn't perfect, and there are still plenty of cringe-inducing moments that mark the show as a product of its time, but the intention to make the show a force for good was there. The creators of the radio show were so determined to pit their Superman against the forces of prejudice and discrimination that they made a bigot another of Superman's major recurring antagonists. Listeners to The Adventures of Superman were introduced to George Latimer on September 3rd, 1946, two months after the conclusion of The Clan of the Fiery Cross. It was the first episode of a 17-part serial with the rather informative title, George Latimer, Crooked Political Boss. Yes, Briggs, what is it? Sorry to interrupt, sir, but the veterans who are meeting on the lawn are marching toward the Capitol. Call the state police barracks. Tell them I want a squad of men over here immediately. Yes, sir. All right, George. You got me into this. Now get me out. Ah, oh, take it easy, Frank. Nothing to get excited a about. A thousand raving maniacs is plenty to get excited about. What do I do with them? What do I tell them? You're governor of the state, aren't you? In name only, and you know it. So does everyone else. It's no secret that big George Latimer runs the works. Ah, don't lose your head, Frank. That's what they want you to do. I know, but you've got to get me out of this hole. Those G.I.s are sore because we've kept well, certain people out of state jobs. We've kept foreigners out, Frank. Foreigners. But they're citizens, taxpayers. They fought in the army. In my book and in your book, too, they're still foreigners. They're not like us, are they? Well, I... Are they? No, I guess not. That's but... all you've got to say, Frank. You've got to keep repeating their foreigners. That they're trying to undermine America. Trying to sell us out. Well, that was the Hitler line. Not a bad line, was it? George Latimer isn't the first bigoted villain to be directly equated with Hitler in the radio show. By this point, it's become a standard move for the writers. But think about how provocative that must have sounded to some folks in the audience in 1946, the year after the end of the Second World War. Here was a popular radio show produced primarily for children saying that the prejudice being propagated by American racists and xenophobes was no different than that of the Nazis. What sets Latimer apart from the earlier bigoted villains is that he is embedded in the government. Frank Hill and Sigrid Wilson, the leaders of the racist organizations depicted in the Hate Mongers organization and the Clan of the Fiery Cross, are essentially independently wealthy white supremacists using their own resources to carry out their campaigns. Latimer, 
while not an elected official himself, is presented as the power behind the throne, manipulating weak-willed Governor Frank Wheeler to execute a white supremacist, anti-immigrant agenda using the power of the state. Following that bit you just heard, Latimer tells Governor Wheeler to go outside and address the veterans who have gathered on the Capitol steps to protest racial discrimination in the awarding of state jobs to veterans. Latimer declares that they will blame the protest on Sam Robbins, the Jewish best friend of protest leader Joe Martin. Latimer suggests accusing Robbins of being a communist as well, just to strengthen their case against him. Wheeler reluctantly speaks to the angry vets and denies the charges that state jobs are being denied to certain applicants due to their race or religion. The protesters don't buy it, and when Wheeler admits that they are being selective about who gets the jobs and repeats Latimer's line about wanting to avoid foreigners who are trying to undermine America, the crowd grows angry. Panicking, Wheeler orders the state police to open fire on the protesters. Protest leader Joe Martin is shot and taken to a hospital in critical condition. When Clark Kent begins to investigate, he uncovers some suspicious details. Martin was apparently the only person wounded in the shooting. But how does that make sense if the police opened fire on the crowd? Sergeant Adams of the state police insists that while his men did fire their Tommy guns at the governor's order, they all fired over the heads of the protesters. Furthermore, the bullet the doctors remove from Joe Martin is a different caliber than the firearms carried by the state police. You can probably guess where this is going. While Clark and Sergeant Adams are wondering who could have possibly fired that shot at Martin, if it wasn't the cops, George Latimer walks in and claims that he witnessed Sam Robbins shooting Joe Martin. This claim is given credence a bit later when the gun used to shoot Martin is found in Robbins' home. Obviously, Sam Robbins is being set up by George Latimer, who also has help from a corrupt reporter from The Daily Clarion, a rival paper to The Daily Planet. Eventually, Governor Wheeler loses his stomach for the whole business and flips on Latimer, secretly working with Clark, private investigator Candy Meyer, and Metropolis Police Inspector Henderson to expose Latimer. Things don't go smoothly. Latimer learns of Wheeler's disloyalty and has him brutally beaten. Clark and Henderson convince Wheeler to play dead. Henderson tells Latimer of Wheeler's death, and Latimer goes to pay his respects to Wheeler, who has been drugged, to make it appear that he is dead. Once Wheeler is awake again, Clark has him record a message for Latimer. Then... In a spectacular attempt to secure a confession from Big George Latimer, the vicious boss of the state political machine, Clark Kent had Governor Wheeler make a phonograph record. Then, as Superman, Kent placed a small record player outside Latimer's 20th floor bedroom window at midnight. While Inspector Henderson listened on the dark terrace just below, Superman played the record. Awakened by the voice of the man he thought he had murdered, Latimer told himself first that he was dreaming, then that he was being tricked. And finally, as we continue now, he has lost nearly all reason. Crazed with fear, he seizes a revolver from his bed table and fires blindly at the figure of Superman silhouetted in the window. You wanted to discredit the war veterans who wanted jobs. No, no. So you shot Joe Martin and said that Sam Robbins, a Jewish war hero, did it. But I... Is that so, George? Yes, 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 yes. You I did. Go away, Frank. Please. Williams, the Clarion Please go away. reporter, plant your gun in Sam Robbins' home. But I didn't mean... And then because Lippy knew too much, you murdered him but too. I... Uh... Didn't you, Please, George? Frank. Please. Your black heart cried out for blood, so you persuaded me to send Sam Robbins upstairs. That isn't true. Where you had arranged for other warp-minded bigots like no, no. yourself to lynch him. That isn't true. Didn't you, George? Didn't you? Yes. Yes, yes. I told you I did. What more can I say? Now, let me alone now. Go away, please. Frank, go away. Please. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Well, Inspector Henderson, did you hear everything? Yes, everything, yes, Superman. You yes, sure put yes, the fear of the Lord into this scoundrel? Yes, and how? I'm about to switch the light on, Latimer, so get ready for a little surprise. Superman! Inspector Henderson! Right. Now keep your hands up, Latimer. You're under arrest. Oh, I get it now. 
You tricked me. Right the first time. And we did it with nothing but a little record player. You can't get away with it. Keep your hands up, I said. There are two witnesses to your confession. Superman and myself. That's enough to send you to the chair, Latimer. Now, climb into your street clothes. We're going bye-bye. Latimer goes to prison. Governor Wheeler resigns in disgrace. Sam Robbins is cleared of all charges. And Joe Martin recovers from his gunshot wound. But that's not the last we hear from George Latimer. The following year, beginning in May of 1947, Latimer returns to seek his revenge in the serial Superman vs. Kryptonite. In the teaser for the story, which aired in the latter segments of the concluding episode of the previous serial, Phantom of the Sea, George Latimer, now a prison orderly, meets with another of Superman's past enemies, the Laugher, who now lays dying in the prison infirmary. The Laugher uses his final moments of life to tell Latimer where to find a piece of kryptonite he has hidden on the outside. He also tells Latimer that if he wants to get to Superman, he should go through Clark Kent. A week later, Latimer is released from prison. He masterminded the murder of one person, the attempted murder of another person, for which he tried to frame an innocent person, and then the attempted murder of yet another person, who also happened to be the sitting governor of the state at the time, and he got less than a year in prison? I take back everything I ever said about this show being unrealistic. Anyway, Latimer gets out of prison and pays a visit to Clark Kent at the Daily Planet. Surprised to see me here, aren't you, Kent? Didn't think I'd have nerve enough to face you. Oh, no one has ever questioned your nerve, Latimer. What do you want? Oh, nothing very much. Just a little help from you. Well, don't expect any help from me. If I had my way, they'd run you out of the state. Tell me, Kent, what have you got against me? The same thing I've got against anyone who pushes people around, particularly little people who can't fight back. You're a narrow-minded, bigoted carbon copy of Hitler, and you're a menace to all the decent people of this or any other state. Okay, if that's how you feel about it. But before I go, I'd like you to deliver a message for me. I'd like you to tell Superman I want to see him. Are you kidding? He wouldn't soil his hands on you. I think he'd be glad to see me. Oh, you do? Yes. Just mention one word to him. Kryptonite. Now, what do you know about kryptonite? All right. If you want to know, I'll tell you. I've got the only piece of kryptonite in the world. What? And you know what it can do. It can control Superman. Do you hear me? It can control Superman! <laughs> In the next episode, the conversation between Clark and Latimer escalates to the point of violence as Clark backs Latimer up against the wall and lays hands on him. Lois Lane interrupts and Latimer flees. Then, okay, so this is a long story and it takes a few pretty sharp turns. So let me just try to hit the high points. Um, Latimer accuses Superman of blackmailing and framing him and convinces a certain portion of the public that he's telling the truth, thus soiling Superman's reputation. Superman enlists the help of his friends, Batman and Robin, in retrieving the piece of kryptonite, but after they're nearly caught sneaking into Latimer's home to look for it, Superman decides not to endanger his friends any longer and sends them away. Shortly after that, Latimer uses the kryptonite to capture Superman and takes him to a mill in a remote area outside of Metropolis. There, working with his assistant Blake and a Nazi scientist named Dr. Marsh, Latimer realizes that there is only one surefire way to kill Superman, starve him to death. This is one of the idiosyncrasies of the radio version of Superman. Kryptonite saps his strength, but it doesn't rob him of his invulnerability. Even under the effects of kryptonite, you can't shoot Superman or stab him. His skin will deflect the bullet or the blade, just like always. But Superman, as depicted in the radio show, does need to eat and drink, just like everyone else. Which means the only way to kill him is to deprive him of food and water while continually exposing him to kryptonite so he can't fly away and get a sandwich and a Coke. Latimer and his cohorts deciding to starve Superman to death is pretty grim stuff, especially for a kid's show. 
Fortunately for Superman and any worried youngsters in the audience, Latimer decides he can't afford to wait for Superman to die of starvation, especially with Batman and Robin continuing to comb the countryside looking for him. Dr. Marsh comes up with an alternative. He uses some of the kryptonite to create a serum that robs Superman of his memory. After having a few doses forced down his throat, Superman can't remember who he is. Superman is stripped of his costume and dressed in overalls. The mill is damaged in a severe storm, and the kryptonite is knocked away, allowing the amnesiac Superman to escape, wandering off into the country. Eventually, he finds his way to the nearby town of Gainesville, where he gets a job as a pitcher for the local baseball team under the name Bud Smith. Quickly becoming a minor league sensation, Superman, aka Bud, is soon called up to the big league Metropolis Ball Club. Jimmy Olsen believes Bud Smith is actually Clark Kent, who has also been missing, obviously. George Latimer finds out that Superman is now a pitcher named Bud Smith and manages to recapture him at the ballpark on the night of his first game for Metropolis. Latimer and Dr. Marsh plan to give Superman more of the serum intending to erase his memory permanently, but Batman and Robin manage to link Latimer to Dr. Marsh and eventually track them to a farm where they're holding Superman. Batman and Robin manage to free Superman from the influence of the kryptonite, but now they're surrounded by Latimer and several of his thugs, and Superman still can't remember who he is. What to do? Batman's got an idea. What do we do, Batman? He'll have the kryptonite in a minute. Quick, Robin. Grab hold of Superman's belt. Watch them, Watch them, Do as I say. Now, Superman, listen to me. Do you want to help us? Why, yes, but why do you call ah, me Superman? my friend. Batman, look. Latimer's got the kryptonite. Superman, say, up and away. Then leap up. Leap up. Do what as for? I say, please, hurry. Ah, Superman. I'll take care of you. And then Batman and Robin. Do what I told you, will you? Hurry, or we'll all be done for. Do it, Superman. Now, oh, say, Superman, well, uh, you're through. All right, I don't understand, but here goes. Up and away. <laughs> Leaping upward as Batman has instructed Superman with his two costumed friends clinging to his belt, zooms like a meteor, crashing through floors and ceilings and roof, and flashes up from the shattered farmhouse into the heavens like a mighty jet-propelled rocket. Higher, Superman zooms, and higher. Then, as Batman and Robin begin to turn blue and shake with cold, the pressure of the high altitude and the shock of rocket-like flight seems to explode a gigantic whirling pinwheel in the mind of the Man of Steel. For a moment, he gapes about him, looks down at the two costumed figures who cling to his belt. And then, slowly, the expression of stupefied amazement fades from his face, and he laughs aloud. Ha, ha, ha! Superman, of course, that's who I am! Superman! Swiftly then, the joyful Man of Steel clasps his arms about his two shivering, nearly unconscious friends and plummets downward to a green, sun-bathed hill. Batman, Robin, snap out of it. Uh, I'm all right, I guess. Uh, well, Superman, you know us. I've recovered my memory, Batman and Robin, thanks to you two. Hallelujah, was that close. One second more and Latimer would have finished all of us. You said it, Robin. Wait, Scott, I forgot about Latimer. He's still got the kryptonite. Uh -oh. That's right. Up with you fellows. <clears throat> and back to that farmhouse. Up and away! Returning to the farmhouse, Superman, Batman, and Robin find that it has collapsed as a result of Superman's crashing through it just now. Sorting through the wreckage at super speed, Superman discovers what's become of Dr. Marsh and George Latimer. Batman! Robin! Come here! What's up, Superman? Hey, look, Batman. He's found Latimer and Dr. Marsh. Right. And the rest of the gang. Are they alive? Most of the gang are, I think, but Latimer and his Nazi partner look done for. Uh-oh. They're lucky at that. They'd have gotten the electric chair if they survived this. Well, either that or a year in prison. Yes, either way, they were finished. Latimer wanted to be a Hitler in this country. Wanted to use his political power to discriminate against good Americans just because they attended a different church from his. Or because their skin happened to be a different color. 
Well, he finished up where Hitler did, and Mussolini, and all the other bigoted tyrants. That's right, Superman. Well, there's only one more thing to do before we get Inspector Henderson out here. Pick up that lead box, will you, Batman? Oh, yes, yes, the kryptonite. Well, what are you going to do with it, Superman? I'll show you. Up into my arms, you two. There. Now, out to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Up and away! <laughs> Superman tosses the kryptonite into the middle of the ocean, then changes to Clark Kent and returns to the Daily Planet, where he's welcomed back by his overjoyed colleagues, Lois, Jimmy, and Perry White. He admits to being Bud Smith, star pitcher, but when the others demand to know how he was able to play ball like, well, like Superman, Clark pleads ignorance, insisting that he lost his memory during that time and has no idea what happened. As a matter of fact, I'm starting to feel rather strange again. What? You are? Yes, I... I'll take it easy, Ken. I... Here, lie down on my couch. Oh, thank you, Chief. Listen, Clark. No I'm... more questions, Lois. No more questions. Don't you see the poor fellow's all in? You don't want him to get amnesia again, do you? I was just going to ask him if he wanted a pillow. Do you, Clark? No, thank you, Lois. But please don't ask me any more questions. It, it sort of makes my head spin. Gosh, no wonder. After all you've been through. Yes, poor chap. Hmm. You know, something tells me we'll never find out exactly what happened. Well, maybe someday I'll be able to tell you, Lois, but not right now. Not for a long time, I'm afraid. And that's it. Unusually for The Adventures of Superman, there's no teaser for the next story. The show took a summer break this year and didn't return with new episodes until the following September. Even though it concludes with the promise of more adventures to come, the ending of Superman vs. Kryptonite provides a sense of closure that the radio show never really offered its audience any other time. Superman regains his memory, is reunited with his friends, and has permanently defeated his two greatest threats, Kryptonite and George Latimer. It's not the series finale, but if it had been, it would have worked. The elimination of kryptonite was a big deal in and of itself, and George Latimer was presented as such a major foe that his death made the end of the story feel truly conclusive. Which is not to say the story itself doesn't have its problems. Of the two George Latimer stories, I prefer the first one, not only because it spends more time presenting and refuting Latimer's bigotry, but also because it's not nearly as drawn out and repetitive as Superman vs. Kryptonite. Across 33 episodes of Superman vs. Kryptonite, Latimer acquires and subsequently murders multiple partners slash henchmen, captures Superman and takes him to a secluded hideout twice, and runs through multiple plans to kill him before finally meeting his own ultimate fate. The plot seems to move in circles, and while it does have some delightfully silly details, like the amnesia arc that has Superman becoming a baseball star, that arc ultimately only serves to stretch the story out for a few more episodes. To be fair, none of the serials on the adventures of Superman could be called tightly plotted. They all have contrived cliffhangers and plot twists and placeholder episodes where nothing much happens. Those things go with the format and would be difficult to avoid with a show like this. But Superman vs. Kryptonite takes it to a whole different level. No wonder... They took the summer off after this one. Everyone, from the writers, to the crew, to the cast, to the kids in the audience, must have been exhausted. What shines through the convolutions and complications of the plot is the villainy of George Latimer, the nature of that villainy, and the righteousness of Superman as he stands against it. In both Latimer serials, the creators of Adventures of Superman make clear what he stands for. Religious intolerance, racism, xenophobia, and send a clear message to its audience that such bigotry is unacceptable and a threat to everyone and should be fought against wherever it shows itself. Latimer, in particular, represents a warning against the danger of allowing bigots to gain political power. It's a warning we can always benefit from hearing again, especially now, as right-wing political groups continue to threaten to destroy freedom, peace, and human rights around the world. And it's why I wish George Latimer was as well-known to comics fans and the general public as Lex Luthor. 
Latimer is Superman's forgotten arch nemesis, but he shouldn't be. We forget him and what he represents at our own risk. Latimer poisons Superman with kryptonite that weakens him and makes him forget who he is and who he ought to be. The hatred and ignorance with which Latimer seeks to poison the people of Metropolis has the same effect and is just as dangerous to them and to us as kryptonite is to Superman. When George Latimer returns from prison, Clark Kent reacts to his presence with anger. And that's exactly how we should feel when we see racism or religious intolerance or the vilification of immigrants or anti-queer bigotry or any other form of bigotry. It should make us angry, and we should fight it, just as Superman would, just as Superman does in the Latimer serials and all throughout the adventures of Superman on the radio. If he didn't get mad in the face of bigotry and fight just as tirelessly to defeat it as he fights to defeat gangsters, mad scientists, and alien invaders, then he couldn't possibly be the best Superman ever.